Well, I hope everybody's air conditioning's working well. Yeah. As a heating and cooling guy, you know, that's one thing I hope for. Maybe your air conditioner will break and you'll call me for service. Oh, oh that's right. It's what, what season are we in? Uh, we're in the season of change, I think. That's a, that's a better saying. But anyway, praise God for uh, this opportunity. And uh, I just pray that, uh, that all your needs are being met and uh, that you'll find uh, today a special day. Um, 1969, where maybe some of you weren't born yet, maybe some of you were. Most definitely. Most definitely. <laughs> it's 1969, and I attended a church that basically you attended four days a week, not once. There were no really home groups. There were some Bible studies, per se, but most of the Bible studies, as in the old days, I call them, were held at church. And you were given a room, and there was a title on top of the room, and that's the room you went to. And, and so you really got used to that format. And so for four days a week, uh, my dad or uh, stepmother would drop me off, and I would attend a function for my age group. I'm a young adult. And a little more background, maybe you don't know, that I come from a missional pastoral family. More missional, I think, but we had uh, all on my father's side, and we have a mission uh, aunt and uncle who were missionaries to the Ivory Coast. I have another aunt and uncle that were missionaries to Vietnam. I have another aunt and uncle who were missionaries to South America. And uh, interesting story is that <clears throat> My father always said, my call to them is to get the money up. His job was to stay back and feel the money, the support that maybe the conference or the church couldn't provide. And so it was at an early age when I realized that my, my calling is in the mission field. Well, this is going to be great. I'm going to be like my aunt and uncle. So I programmed my mind to think that I could do it. I could really be that missionary, that one that was sent to another foreign land, maybe follow my aunt and uncle in, in the Ivory Coast, because that was a, a pretty strong missional group that had been there for at least 25 years preceding them. And so anyway, I had put it in my mind that the church wasn't really providing the nourishment that I needed to train me in what I needed to do to be that missional person. <clears throat> Ken's going to know this sermon pretty well. <laughs> but what it is, is that they convinced me that I could do it on my own merit. So imagine a moment that coming from a missional background, I'm getting the support from the aunt and uncles, and the decision was made. I made the decision. You notice I haven't mentioned God yet? I made the decision that I was going to the mission field. Now, God's a funny God. He has great humor. I can promise you before I'm sent to the mission field, there's going to be a test. And there was a test. It was, uh, I don't know if you know Akron, Ohio at all. It was... I worked at the Chapel Hill Mall. The church was right next door to it. And I was uh, the manager of the record department because I thought I could get girls that way. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is I managed the record department and I closed the store at 9 o'clock or I closed the store at, at, uh, on Saturday or Sunday. And there was no, at that time, no, the mall wasn't open on Sunday. But I got to see something that was just for me. Now, why do I say that? It's because what are the odds of me getting in my car following a, a day of work, getting in my car and getting ready to pull out of the parking lot? The mall was emptying out. And I was right behind a white car with two older women in it. And I saw something I didn't quite know what I saw. It was a, a woman doing this and there were two young legs sticking out of the back seat. And I, what am I seeing? 
I think I'm seeing a young girl getting beat. And I went, oh man, let me look at this again. So I watched some more because I'm right behind it. I'm no, no further than that chair and I in my car exiting the parking lot. You see, as I remember exactly, I had a choice. What do you think God was teaching me in that moment? What was I going to do? Was I going to find a police officer? Was I going to get a license plate number? What was I actually going to do in this moment of test? Because how could I possibly think that I'm going to the mission field if I can't pass this simple test of coming alongside somebody who's hurting? Right? Would everybody agree? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Guess what I did? Your response is okay. I hope you said I did something. By the way, I did nothing. I did nothing. That's when I realized that I had never been taught To wait upon the Lord. See, that's our subject today. With all the things that the <clears throat> church had taught me support, leadership, service, and other things as a young man designed and destined for godly service. I failed to understand what it was like to wait upon the Lord. And don't get, don't, let's not get misled at all. This is not waiting upon the Lord. I mean, this is not, I'm sorry, waiting on Him. This is waiting upon the throne, waiting upon all that He is. Because it's in that that we find that power and authority that we need to serve. On the other hand, what's the first thing you, that comes to your mind when you hear the word wait? Trying to get into a restaurant, somebody coming back to pick you up, sitting at a traffic light waiting for the traffic to move, waiting for the bathroom to open up just to come to church. That's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. This is a, pandem a pandemic time, waiting... Uh, Waiting is a second nature. Jane said that she, yesterday she was at the Target and she went shopping and she got all her shopping done. And if she was going to get in the line, she had to not only get in the one that's in the rear of the store because that's all along the line was. Yeah. Waiting. Waiting. Yeah, waiting upon the Lord is so quite different. It might be the most important moment of your Christian life. And I'm here to tell you, it was, it was the most important moment in my Christian walk. A simple failure at 17 years old took me away 20 years from walking in a faithful experience. 20 years. 30, I, I, 17 to about 37 and why did that occur? Because in the very first place when I thought I was going to go serve him, I was serving him in self, not in spirit. I had not yet welcomed in the power of the Holy Spirit to take over. 
And without that, you can't go. You can't be. You can't do. There'll be no reward whatsoever if you're going to do something on yourself and call it something that you created, something that you designed, and expect some results in a godly way from it. It's not going to happen. Amen. 20 years of bondage. And I think about that, and I think about it quite often. But yet at that mark, that 20-year anniversary, did I have the opportunity to go on a heating service call in the place that I'd accepted the Lord. And simply put is that I was slain in the spirit, thrown on my face. And all I heard was this, are you ready to begin? See, a lot of us are like that. We have a, a pandemic moment in our spiritual walk and something happens that draws us away from him. And the next thing you know, we're gone. We might even attend, but we're still gone in spirit. It's like, like, it's like I'm not here. And what are we blaming on? I'm thankful for the memory. I'm thankful for the fact that I can recall exactly what it was like to disobey God. But I can also recall right to the moment where he says, are you ready to begin? God's a, a thankful God. He's a precious God. He's a loving God that he would wait those 20 years waiting for me to do what? Show up. And I, I don't know if, if anybody here is going through that conflict of something draw, has drawn you away from Christ after the experience of accepting, accepting him as Lord. It's a terrible place to be, by the way. I, I know. I know. But when I learned how to wait upon the Lord correctly and have him supply the things that happen during when you're waiting. By the way, it doesn't mean you're out here serving food. It doesn't mean you're pastoring. It doesn't mean you're in a mission field when you're waiting upon the Lord. It's just saying, that's the place I need to be to get all I can be. Because the throne can't wait to give it to you. I notice all the blessings books are missing and I can't wait to get more of them. And only because that somebody's desiring to find out what God has planned for you. And what he wants for you. Amen. <laughs> it might be the most important, as I said, decision when you decide. And in fact, I want you to say it in word with me. You don't even have to say it out loud. Lord, I, I, in this one moment, I'm going to wait upon you. Now, there will be those that already are in that, in that mode, but... For those who have not experienced this, please do understand, say to yourself, okay, right now, I'm going to wait upon you. Here's what's going to happen, by the way, and I promise you it will happen, because the God I serve promised it. One, it's going to be a time you're going to see God act. You know, he's going to do something only he can do. Yes. Every time I pray now, in fact, during our Tuesday group, when we pray for uh, Stephanie and we pray for us, what do we say? Lord, I need a God moment. Mm -hmm. Because if it's a man's moment, I know man can do it. <laughs> but I want a God moment only right. he can do. Amen. To deliver us from things that are standing in his way. Yeah. Number two, yeah. if you're in a waiting upon the Lord moment, you're going to be in this moment. Because it's, it's a place that you're going to be told that by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the way, this is standing in between you and me. Yeah. That's just the way God works. Yeah. That's what He wants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't want separation. He doesn't want a wall built. He, no. he, doesn't, he has to have you and Him together as one. Right. How about a time of transformation? Now we use that word somewhat in restoration of salvation, don't we? Yeah. We, we, you hear that a lot. But when you're waiting upon the Lord, complete transformation can occur. And the bondage of sin, some of that sin which has not yet been forgiven, can be dismissed. Yes. How would you like to feel that way? I'd love to have that. Yes. I do have that. Mm -hmm. 
He yeah. has forgiven me. Yeah. 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 And I pray that he's forgiven you. Yeah. I pray that you have that heart of, I'm waiting upon you, Lord, today, and I need transformation. Yeah. I need some of that, that garbage that still exists. I need to move it away because I'm tired. I'm yeah. tired of separating. Yeah. I, I received you this time. I received you, I mean, 10 years ago, and now I'm having trouble. Yes. Yeah. Well, you're having trouble because you put things in between them. A time that he can answer your prayer. Yes. You know, the Tuesday group and other groups, the Thursday prayer group, and I'm sure Wednesday night the same. We pray with expectation that he will answer prayer. Yeah. Well, why are we bothering praying? Yeah. Well, in your time of waiting upon the Lord, you and him only, it'll be your time for answered prayer. God's going to be so good to you. And he's going to bless you with thought. Yes. He's going to bless you with word. He's going to bless you with his presence. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, that, that, that bondage that you felt in your body or in your mind is gone. Yes. Why? Because he's in that business of answered prayer. Mm -hmm. To make wrong right. Mm -hmm. Listen, to me it's a huge one. To make wrong right. I needed forgiveness in this moment when I saw what I did. That it haunted me for 20 years, and in fact, the Satan used it to capture me for that period of time. I couldn't get away. How would you like to be reminded that you you think you have a walk? Now, oh, by the way, you know what you did? Not you. But you know what you did, meaning me. It's Satan's way of saying you're not good enough to receive everything I've just told you, plus more. So you've got to wait. And you say, Lord, make wrong right. Make wrong right. How about to provide your needs? How many people are providing a right and not praying for a need? I'm sure you are. Sure you are. Absolutely. We're praying for needs. How would you like to know that the God that you're now resting in, the God that you're now waiting upon, is now ready to do business with you. Why? Because he has your attention. Mm -hmm. To renew your strength. And by the way, this pandemic is weakening me. It's weakening me. My word, I, I'm tired. I'm tired of waiting. I'm tired of not seeing faces and holding people. I'm a hugger. I'm a lover. I'm designed to, to come alongside you and be part of your, your deeds. Mm -hmm. That's love. Mm -hmm. And for me not to be able to do that, to say, keep your six feet away. Put your mask on. All the other things, it's driving me crazy and making me weak. Mm -hmm. This one here is huge, and I don't do enough of it. I, I, I know my brother does, and I'm just so thankful that I, I sort of piggyback his spirit to reveal God's glory. See, that's huge in you're waiting upon the Lord because if he doesn't think you think this of him, what's that going to be like when you're trying to get his attention? Who is the God that we serve? He's the God on the throne. He's the God that knows all things. He's the God that, that loves. He's the God that cares. He's the God that disciplines. He's the God that has an ear waiting for you. But when we don't recognize God for who he is, the throne for what it is, the coming of Christ for what it will be like, then I'm not too sure that you're ready to wait upon the Lord completely. As we said before, to allow God to do what only God can do. We have a neighbor who I've gotten to know pretty well who has designed their life about when there's a situation where they, there's needs, there's personal spiritual needs. I can promise you this, there's going to be a purchase made, a large purchase. And they go out and they buy something and they, they put it out there and guess what happens? They, they see me, hey, Dave, come over, look what we bought. And I, for 
first thing, and I, Jane and I, we sort of chuckle a little bit. I wonder what's going on in their relationship. Because I know they don't make a purchase unless there's something wrong. Mm -hmm. There's no band date for a separation from Christ. There's no purchase date you can make that's going to separate you from Christ. There's none. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's going to draw you to himself, by the way, is who? It's you. Yeah. Amen. That's our only choice. It's our only place that we can go. Yeah. Let me read you a little bit of scripture. Joel, would you mind passing out my hand out, please? What were we really saying here, Lord? I'm relying on you. Isaiah 40, 30, and 31. I'll read this to you. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like wings, like eagles. They shall not run, and they will not be weary. They shall walk, and they won't faint. Praise God for that. We need some restoration here. We need some strength. To put it simply, it all boils down to where your present strength and power comes from. And this scripture is huge, and the Lord gave me this at about 3.30, 4 o'clock this morning. Thank you, Joel. An eagle rises to great heights, but how far would it ever go without wind? You hear what I'm saying? How high would an eagle fly without the wind? How far could we ever go without the love of Christ? And that's where waiting upon the Lord begins. It's realizing that a reliance needs absolutely to be something we cannot see. We cannot see. It's not, a, it's not stopping in the local drive through line and picking up a happy meal to make you happy. Not going to happen. You can't purchase it. Do you know it's there? Do you know where God lives? Have you experienced the throne? Do you know what it looks like? Revelation 3 tells you a real good story. Isaiah tells you another thing. What it really looks like, it's a beautiful place. And the 24 elders are right now around the throne. And they, they come to a spot, by the way, they said, uh, they look behind them and they see us, possibly. Where these people come from? And the other one says, by the way, we've been praying for them for a long period of time. We're glad they're here. And by the way, God wants you to be one of them. I don't know where you are today in your relationship with God, but like me, it may take some practice deliberately waiting upon the Lord. For me, I like asking God as I begin my day, when I finally my feet hit the ground, I'm a simple-minded man in the sense I ask him how he's doing. How, oh, Lord, how you doing? What are you doing? I want to know what God's doing. You want to know why? There's nothing more precious to see God work. Here's the third one. I, help me to see what you see. You know, I, I think we misinterpret when we accept Christ as our Lord and take him into ourselves, and he's now dwelling inside of us, that when we see things that are not of him, that are quite immoral, we're asking him to see it too. Forgive me, Lord. I have to say that. That's all I, that's all I can say. Lord, forgive me. Because I know I see things that you don't want me to see. Then I say, do you have anything for me today? I wait. And if he responds in a thought, I ask, Lord, how can I help you? That's how I start. It's not done with really that much eloquence. It's just simple words asking for simple answers.
How are we doing so far? Let's get specific. There are three things I'm going to share with you that have made an absolute difference in my walk, and I pray that it is if you have made a decision to wait upon the Lord. Ready? Mom, one. Pick a scripture that pertains to your situation you may be going through. Pick a scripture. All right, now, what I'm saying by that is that I handed out these ten. These ten are wonderful scriptures. But you don't have to pick one of these. Pick your own. Put a, put a card, by the way. Write that scripture on a card. Put it on your, your, your refrigerator. And then I want you to put that scripture also on the front of your cell phone. So when you pick up your cell phone, immediately know that's what's on your heart. Because what's on your heart is what's on God's own heart. Amen? Write it on a card. Put it on the background picture of your cell phone. Number two, if you are one who is waiting for healing, find a biblical story that describes Jesus as a healer. Right. It's huge. By the way, if, if, if Jesus is in the healing business and, and you all of a sudden are needing to be healed, I'd rather see him work. And those stories allow you to see Jesus work. Mark 6:56. Listen to this, this story. Wherever he went in villages, cities, or the countryside, they brought the sick out, of the, out to the marketplaces. They, the people, begged him to let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe. And all who touched him were healed. Mark 6, 56. You see, if, you're, if you need healed, you might as well reference where healing is. There's no reason to hide behind this. Jesus is a healer. He's wanted. He wants to do some work. Um, would somebody, uh, Joel, read this for me, buddy. Isaiah 53, 4 through 6. Now, before he reads it, and... and I want you to understand what you're about to hear coming out of Isaiah is do we ever think that the salvation experience is a healing experience or do we we look at it more something else is the salvation experience a healing experience well absolutely this scripture will verify that brother go ahead yet it was our If you think your salvation experience is not a healing experience, might as well close the book. Because even no matter where you're at and wherever your walk is today, whether you've separated yourself by a sinful condition that's still got bondage and hold over you, I can promise you this, Jesus is still in the healing business. Thank you. If you're waiting on the Lord to provide, why not immerse yourself in the truth that God takes care of, your cho of his children? And, and, and it's a huge part, and it was big for me to think of yourself as a child of God. It's, you know, we're men, we're beasts. We want to think we are in control of something. I'm his child. I want to rest in his arms as a child. I want transformation to occur as if I'm a child. I want to be disciplined if I've done something wrong as a child. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you don't think of yourself as a child and you think you've risen above that, that call, I can promise you this, that's a mistake. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. 
Remember this, a farmer who only plants a few seeds will get a small crop. And by the way, that's the transformation that's really happened in my last 15, 20 years. I want a large crop. I'm excited about the crop and what's been growing. I see the hand of, of healing on my son's life. Taking time. It's not an instantaneous thing, what he went through. By the way, I was going to give it in testimony, but I'll share it now. It's, it's simply they've reduced his meds and planned to reduce them some more. And as they reduce his meds, what do you think happens? He gets more productive. Praise God. God's in the healing business. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your own heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all of your needs. Do you hear what I said? He will generously provide all your needs. Then you will always have enough not only enough for yourself, but by the way, you're going to have extra. And when you have extra, what do you do with it? Yes, yeah, share it. You guys are a great choir, by the way. <laughs> whatever, you con whatever your concerns, whatever your situation, begin focusing and directing them to the only place you need to go. It's Jesus, and it's the only time that you can do that. It's in a place where I'm resting in you, Lord. I want to be in your business and I want to understand who you are, what you are, what your plans are for my life. And not try to do it on your own because it never works. I'm telling you, bondage for 20 years is no fun. It is no fun. But the redemption factor and renewal factor of what's happened in my heart is absolutely only of God then I, now I can see him who he is. But God is slow. He's as, he's as fast as you want to go, but he's as slow as you go. I must have been pretty slow. Listen, I want to go to that handout. And I'll tell you what. Scriptures that pertain to waiting upon the Lord is huge. This is one of those, by the way, refrigeration moments. I'd like something on the refrigerator that before I open it up and feed this big belly of mine, I can take a look at something maybe God has planned. I just want to look at a few. There's, by the way, there's three or four for me. They're mine. My scriptures. They're the ones that have meant the most to me. And as we look at them, you'll know which ones. I am convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love. Who has been here separated from God's love? You don't have to raise your hand. You know who you are. You know the feeling of not feeling loved? Isaiah 43, 2. When you go through deep waters, I will be there. Folks, if you're having some problems, give it to him. If you're having problems that only that he can provide, give it to him. Man can't help you. Sure, they'll give you a short-term re remedy, but only God can give you the permanent remedy. I will be there. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown even though you think you're drowning. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. Now, we as a nation haven't yet been oppressed, really. Like my brother, as he talked about over in China and other nations right now that are feeling that oppression, we've been pretty free to come and go and do what we want to do. I mean, my word, my Tuesday night group, I, I, I love it. I'm in love with the Lord and what he's doing there. But that might have to stop someday. The, you know, the oppression that can come from higher authority, that can tell us not to meet anymore, that can tell us not to meet in your home or you'll be fined, or the possibility of imprisonment that you know about, can I know? It's possible. But you know our, our answer to that normally as an adult? Not in my lifetime. I don't have to worry about it. Well, when it comes knocking on your door, remember this day. 
Let's go on. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Well, that's, that's so huge because a lot of people don't want to wait. I want it now. The commercials that are on television are telling us, I want it now. Romans 8, 28, it goes down. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. By the way, I serve a winner. I serve a winner. And this is one of my, my scriptures, by the way, the next one. Jeremiah 29, 11. <laughs> I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Start praying that prayer over and over again. You're going to find that all of a sudden that bondage and that oppression of, of things that are not of God will, will be gone. They'll be dismissed. And finally, we go down to the last one. For I hold you by your right hand. I, the Lord, your God. You, you, you know the significance? when you are waiting upon the Lord in this spot that you have this advantage because when he reaches down and grabs you in this point what's going to happen he reaches down and gets you he's grabbing you by your hand two things are going to happen he's lifting you up he's lifting you up and as he lifts you up I can promise you this he's going to cradle you in his arms now lift you up and he's going to cradle you in his arms and I say to you don't be afraid if I'm only here to help um, thank you for allowing me to give this message first of all because I know I know then in some of our lives, we're being held back in some sort of bondage of a pre-existing condition that happened in our life somewhere, somehow. Let's, let's at least be honest in that. Somehow, somewhere, something happened in your life. Maybe that people don't know that about you. I'm not suggesting that you put it as an ad on the front page of the newspaper. I'm simply saying, as we're waiting in the presence of God, why don't you give it away? Give it to the only one that can remove it from me. You know, it took 20 years to remove that scene from my memory. I was in constant disarray, reminded of what I had done that God had asked me to do. Possibly save that little girl's life. But if you're in that spot today, if you know and you know that, Lord, there's something that's holding me back. There's something I've done in the past. I've never given it to you. I've never given it to you. And I know if I give it to you, in fact, I've gotten so used to having it, I don't even want to give it to you. Hear that. Think about what I'm saying, folks. You get so used to having it as a bondage that you don't want to give it away because you got so used to being in bondage. Amen. Amen. I, listen, it's time to give it away. Amen. Today's your day. It's time to be free. Yeah. And freedom is good. Freedom is good. Before we pray, I do want to say this, that you know, as I get older and I'm getting older, uh, I'm not too sure how wiser I'm getting, but I'm getting older. The truth is, is that he has me exactly where he planned on putting me. It's a great place to be. As my brother said, you know, we, we are a group of people that of mature minds and great spirits and great prayer warriors and, and thoughts of, of redemptive spirits. We, we, we are encouraged by all of those things. I'm exactly where God has planned in this season. 
Can't wait for next season. But now let's get back. If you're here, yes, you know Jesus. Yes, you've received him as Lord and Savior. Yes, you, you've acknowledged all that he did on the cross for you. But yet, there's something in the past that's still got bondage over you, that the chains are still on you over it. You're reminded of it either by person or by spirit. I'm going to be praying a prayer of, we're going to give it to you, Lord. We're going to give it to you. And we're asking you to do the things that only you can do. That's what we're going to pray here today. Let's bow our heads. A little moment of silence to get you ready to prepare your heart for what is about to happen. Because I believe it's going to happen. Father, we praise you for this morning where you are speaking and not me. We thank you for what was said. You preached the hearts of some people. Lord, you say we're two or more gathered together in your name. You're here. You're here. Thank you. Now I'm asking in Jesus' name that you do a, only what you can do. That's we need somebody that's in bondage. I pray, I pray a new spirit comes within that person. I pray a new heart in that person. I pray acknowledgement in Jesus' name that it actually happened, because I know it will. But first of all, we've got to believe it's going to happen. We've got to, heart, we've got to have a heart of belief that you can do what you're going to say you can do. So I come to you, Father, not only with my own heart, but I take upon this prayer the other to the place that you designed for it. Take those chains and break them so I don't carry them anymore. This is your day. This is your tomorrow. This is your week. Restore what you plan to restore here today. You're here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. chance. It gives us that one moment where we can say, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready. Here it is. And I know what he's about to say to you. He did it on Tuesday. He'll do it here today. He's going to tell you, I know. I know your heart. I know where you're So let's go to him quietly as we end this prayer. Lord, one of the hardest things that we'll ever do is confess. But when we confess, we are made right with you. We confess. Restore our hearts. Renew our strength as we come to you this day. We praise you, Father. We praise you for this act. And may we walk out of this place, new creatures, not old, not carrying the burden anymore. And all God's people say.